Our first speaker for today is Walter Carrielli from the University of Cantina, and he will speak about form of Denis Law and Carrie's paradox, catch of an expanded theory for asymmetric okay, okay, Thank you. Thank you, Marco and all the organizer, Alberto uh, Michel for inviting me. Thank you, you guys, for listening to me in this first day of spring. And what I'm going to tell you today. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 But I, now I, 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 I'll, I'll be talking about the spring in, in a minute. Uh, and I, I, I intend to present to you today a sketch of a theory of truth, which is very simple. It's a, actually, it's an architecture of a theory of truth, which is very simple and is based upon a uh, sort of a tamed logic. So, the, the idea of this, this, this talk is just to follow. You take logic, you tame it a little bit, you take the power of it. And logic is too powerful, extremely powerful. You tame it a little bit in such a way that you still have a logic. Because it's, it's dangerous if you try to tame logic and you kill it. Okay, so when you tame logic in such a way, you still have a logic, and you add a new, uh, not only a new axiom, but a modification of an axiom. And a new concept. So it's very um, good for, the, for this conference when we are talking about representation and axiomatization, because you see that just by taking a new way of um, uh, symbolizing a new concept, very simple one, and putting it inside logic, we can make some very interesting things like uh, a theory of truth that, in principle, will solve the two hardest problems in theory of truth. Lyer paradox and Kerry paradox at the same stroke. Okay, it's too much. Yes, it is. There's a price to pay. Yes, there is. So we would like to examine it with you. What's the price you have to pay for that? And if it's worth uh, uh, going in the direction of our dogs. Okay, the logic I'm going to present to you is a uh, consistent logic. But when I start talking about consistent logic, people think, okay, this this coming kind of these uh, crazy contradictions and where are they? Uh, is the word contradictory? No, 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 nothing like that. I'm talking about contradiction like this spring today. So I was expecting to be in Paris in the first day of spring and see beautiful sun, flowers, and what I see, pollution, <laughs> uh, free transportation because everybody's using a car, no sun, no flowers. So, Contradictions are not rare. Uh, this is a contradiction. I mean, this is a kind of information contradiction. So contradiction does not have to be a round and square tower. We are, we are surrounded by contradictions like this. I mean, epistemological contradictions, information, contradiction on information, in contradictions on our way of thinking, in a double way here and there. Okay. So that's the way I see paraconsistent logic. A logic that makes you or helps you to reason under such everyday contradictions. You don't need to have something crazy like a, an object that is by itself contradictory uh, in the middle of this room. Like an elephant that's not an elephant, for instance, or something like that. Okay, so, but I, that, that, that's the main idea I'll try to explain to you, but first let me give some very quick motivation. It's not necessary here because I, everyone, including uh, authors of very nice books, Funke and uh, Leon, for instance, authors of very good books on, on the truth. But anyway, I, I will very quickly pass on this um, uh, motivation. So, Remember, for a Tarski, a definition of truth for language is materially adequate if and only if it implies all the instances of the T-schema for the sense of L, where the T-schema is simply this idea that S is true if and only if P, where S is the name of P. Okay, so this very famous example, the sentence, uh, is no is right, if and only if, that thing that you call is no, corresponds to that thing, that, to that quality that you call right. Now, the definition of truth for a language uh, should be formally correct. 
if it, I mean, it should conform to the user logical rules of classical logic and to the rules for constructing <laughs> definitions. So it cannot give a contradiction, but it does, as we know. In principle, it should not. Uh, so Tarski, in his uh, famous papers, presents basically three conditions that, taken together, as you know very well, lead to a trivialization of a theory of truth. I mean, if a language is, um, if I take semantically closed languages, I mean, in the sense that they can talk truth, talk about themselves, even if, as we have seen yesterday, this is a bit dubious, as Forkley has shown, in which sense does, is it, are those kind of sentences talking about themselves, really? We don't know exactly, but in a certain sense, it's accepted that they are uh, talking about their own truth, at least. We'll be assuming the laws of classical logic, or he was assuming the laws of classical logic, not me, because I'm not using it, I'm, I'm going to, to modify this point number two, and in the restrictive validity of the T-scale. Okay, so, Tarski rejected semantically closed languages because he saw that it was sort of impossible. So he was sort of making layers of um, truth in order to avoid the paradox, the paradox or the trivialization of his theory. And developed in this way a hierarchical definition of theory of truth. So he was uh, sort of modifying or, or taking a root one, modifying language in a certain sense. Pfefferman, in uh, a paper, I think it's 2008, restricted the, the, the T-schema and the basic system in, in, in classical logic, so modifying the basic rules, the basic uh, principles, and taking root number two. So what there is, but there is no way a, a, a root number two. So modifying the internal logic. So I... Uh, have you seen this paper? And I, 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 I wrote to Pfefferman, I talked to him about that, and he mentioned his papers, and, and his papers is clearly seen, it's clearly written for him. So, he mentions that a part of consistent logic, I mean, a sort of tamed logic, would be a successful way in dealing with contradictions, but he remarks in his paper, 2008, the following, exactly the following. So far as I know, it has not been determined whether such logic consistent logic, account for sustained ordinary reasoning, not in only in everyday discourse, but also in mathematics and the science. If they do, and if it's very important, they deserve serious consideration as a possible route under two. So that's what this says. So I wrote to him and said, look, why you think that paraconsistent logic is not could we not be possibly responsible for sustaining the ordinary reasoning? And the reply to it is, look, because you guys uh, need some crazy requirements, such as the existence of real contradictions in the world. Where are them? He said, look, I reply, well, said, you were, sorry, but you were confusing two kinds of um, traditions in very consistent life. That, you are confusing the dialectics, like the Graham Priest and the Australian group, with other people that do not require. In our case, we do not require the assumption. Uh, we, we, are, we can do for a consistent logic without being dialectics. Completely free from metaphysical assumptions like that. And he replied back and said, okay, so you guys go and do it. I'm not going to do it. I have other things to do. You do it. Try, try your best, so that's, um, that's what I'm doing here, so facing Pfefferman's challenge. <laughs> uh, so what we do then is that we advocate road number two to develop a theory of truth for arithmetic, materially adequate, philosophically motivated, and whose underlying logic is paraconsistent in this sense that I mean, I mean without being dialectics. So, what I mean is that Pfefferman's concerns are not justified in every, because it's not true that every paraconsistent logic has to be uh, the famous logic LP by Priest. This is one famous paraconsistent logic where, it, of course, Priest tries to apply uh, his logic, which, by the way, is not only his logic, it's 
also due to an Argentinian philosopher, uh, Asenko, who worked his logic much before him. He tries to apply his logic to several things, even to zero truths, even to solve uh, liar paradox. And, but he also, even using his logic, even if we accept his um, uh, dialectistic approach to, 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 the, to the question, I mean, many, I mean, I mean, that exist real contradictions, he cannot solve uh, courage paradox because there's a very important point concerning for a consistency and Curry's paradox. For the paradox does not use negation. And for a consistency is talking about negation. So there is no way to put them together. It's a complication. So I'll show how we can come back a little bit so both, both of them at the same time. Anyway, so what is the, the story about this logic I'm using here? The story is that the notion of a consistency can be expressed within the object language so by this little ball here, so this is, when A is consistent, like a primitive notion, so a representation in the language, and if I, I just change this law of explosion, what I call gently explosion now, by restricting the principle of explosion. I mean, A and not A does not entail in the LFI, the logical formal inconsistence, family of logical formal inconsistent. A and not A does not entail B, while A and not A plus A is consistent in B. Now, I owe you the explanation of what is the story of consistency. So, what's consistency here? Consistency is not... Consistency is not not to be contradictory. Consistency is not necessarily known contradiction. Okay. So what is consistent? The acceptance, there is one, now there is one price to pay. Price to pay, first price to pay, first ticket to enter into this adventure. Uh, you have to be prepared to accept that the world is divided into two categories of, uh, of uh, sentence, of statements. The ones that are flexible, malleable, now I come to, to Austin's suggestion. The ones that are malleable, flexible, like your rubber. The statements that are made of rubber, you can press them by contradictions. Contradictions press, okay? So they don't break. The ones that break are the consistent ones. So, A is consistent, means A is breakable under contradiction. For instance, today is the first day of spring, it's not breakable. We can accept that, I mean, there's a contradiction around the notion of spring. But why? Because I expected something coming to Paris in the first day of spring, you might expect something different because you live in Paris, I do not. You may say, okay, what's the trouble? So, the spring has been like that forever. Since I was born, I was expecting spring to be a beautiful day. So, it's my expectation against your expectation that causes some contradiction in this statement that today is for the spring. But nothing happens. We, because of this contradiction, we do not suppose I don't know, that the, the, the moon is a square or anything like that. Although classical logic entails us that from any contradiction we should derive anything we want. But we do not. Why? Because we recognize that this idea of uh, being the first day of spring is sort of a rubber, is sort of malleable, sort of flexible. It does not break any contradiction. Otherwise, if I see my, if I take my watch with my, my, my telephone with the orange company and I say 322, March 22, something is very, very wrong. Or if I see my bank statements, I see I have 1,000 euros. Now, one minute later, I take my statement and I see 900 euros 
and we immediately alarm it. Something very dangerous is happening. So my bank statement is breakable. You cannot resist any contradiction without a catastrophic conclusion. Or the day of the week. Or if you take a, a bill with three euros in your pocket, you cannot stand that. Right? So, some, because in a sense, in a sense, things connected to number, to arithmetic, in a certain context, tend to be rigid, not malleable. While many other things can be taken as now. Yeah? So, this is because of that. So, Austin uh, suggested me to call this talk Truth as Jinga. Truth as Jinga means Truth as Swing, in a sense that Truth as Jinga. Jinga is the Brazilian word for this dancing, the people that capoeira dancing, this beautiful ladies dancing carnival. Our soccer players, so Ronaldinho or Neymar playing soccer is kind of a very nice movement that we hear. Uh, so, truth as Jinga, <coughs> swing. That, that's it, that, that's the idea. So, something can be flexible, something cannot be. Thanks for the suggestion. Okay, I, 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 do not, I don't know if it is it's clear enough for you, but let me, that's the first price to, to, to pay. So. If you have to admit that the sentences, uh, the, the universe of statements, are divided into into those two uh, subgroups, right? Now, if you accept that, what's classical logic for the people who accept that? Is it logic where everything is breakable? So, classical logic is a particular case of this kind of field. If everything is breakable, we are in classical logic because why? Well, just because if this consistent A, little ball A, is true for any sentence, we are back to this uh, classical realm again. The ball apply only to atomic sentences? No, to anything. Anything. Yes. Can be anything. Okay, now, this, 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 just by this modification, I, I have then a big family of logics, like a layer of um, intermediate logics, from very basic ones, I'm going to, to start from the very basic one, uh, with putting new and more and more and more axioms until you, you get classical logic again. So, and you have several principles. For instance, one is here. So, uh, if A is consistent, this is not the case that A is contradictory but not the converse, but a converse in the logic of B presenting. Now, you can plug the converse axiom to it. You can, you could do it. So if you put, you plug a new axiom, so this is going to be the logic name MBC. If you plug this axiom, you go to the logic CI. So consistency is exactly the same as non-contradiction, but okay. Do you still, do you already have classical logic by doing that moving? No, not yet. So it's lots of other things still missing here to get classical logic. To get classical logic, basically you have to assume that everything is consistent. Not only that the notion of consistent coincides with non-contradiction. You can also plug this, not not A is the same as A. You can plug A or not A, so we do not have to be intuitionistic to, re to reject the tertiary on that term. We do not have to reject anything. Only this thing here. Only to modify this principle. And I'm not only rejecting it, just modifying it. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, okay. The first principle is well, the left to right direction goes in any logic. So it's also of analytical small ball. This one here? Yeah. From left to right? From left to right? Yeah, in this kind of logic, yes. In our, my family of logic, yes. I mean, is there a system of logic in which it doesn't hold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can even you can even make it weaken. Right. So there is one logic named PI, where this does not even even does not this uh, hold. Yeah, this is very basic. But then, if you if you don't have that, you have completely separated meaning between absolutely separated meaning between consistent and, and non-contradiction. So there will be 
sort of uh, independent <laughs> phenomenon. Sorry about that. The delegation is a unary operator or it's unary operator. Okay, yes. Okay. Unary operator. Okay. No secrets here. Everything yeah. is, is fine. <laughs> no, no, I was wondering if it was not defined like uh, you can do in intuitionistic or when you so you, you take implication and go. Yeah, no, no. So, no. You don't need to. You may. You may you may you may take it. I mean if logic is, is strong enough, you can define it from from as, as a by the bottom. Because oh, the, the trouble is, uh, if the negation is weak like that, it's not make a button. But this is a button. This is a button. Because this implies everything. Right? Because of the law. So this is a button. Okay. For instance. Uh, okay, now. Then, as you see, for a consistent logic like that, in having a, a weak negation would be able to avoid uh, liar's paradox. Okay, because I can say, okay, the, the sentence is uh, I'm lying now, or this this very sentence is, is false, and so what? No, nothing happens. No, nothing follows from that. Because negation is, is because I can just by taking this very same sentence of the liar as non-consistent, as flexible, as malleable, then it's not going to, to have any consequence. You can have it there, and it stays there. No problem, right? But no paraconsistent negation will be able to solve a curious paradox, because there's no negation involved in it. So what's the plan here to control the liar and curry paradox by generalizing the basic idea? So I, I will make a Another step, and that's going to be come in the second practical paper. Uh, I'll show you in a moment. I, I'll, I'll be sort of extending this idea uh, towards implication. i show you in a moment. Uh, so the plan would be, instead of restricting inferences from contradictory formulas, I'm going, I'm going to restrict the inferences from suspicious formulas. So what, what's a formula to be suspicious? Okay, so I have second price to pay to accept that some sentences are suspicious, some are not. So I use this uh, uh, star A to mean that A is unsuspicious or that it has been conclusively established as true. So the notion of unsuspicious or conclusively established as true is an intentionally vague notion, but the important point is that it's an epistemological point. So I'm avoiding at all costs any metaphysical notion here. I'm, I'm trying to go towards epistemological notions all the time. Okay. So uh, it, it's a sort of notion outside any formal system, like the idea of being consistent or malleable. How can I prove that a certain statement is malleable or flexible or not consistent. I cannot prove that. That's not a test of logic. So there's something that has to be from outside the system. If today being the first day of spring is a malleable statement or not, it's not for logic to decide. Right? It's for other reasons. It's, it's a philosophical problem, not a logical problem. So logic starts from once you have it classified it, once you have decided it, then logic starts and do its job. Otherwise, it does not. Okay. But now I'm going to, to, to come with a second idea, the idea of unsuspicious. Now, uh, what is unsuspicious? Unsuspicious, I'll be defining the following. Something is unsuspicious if it's consistent and true. Unsuspicious means inconsistent and true. Remember that to be, uh, I mean, consistent and true. Sorry. Consistent and true. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, uh, recall that to be, to be consistent does not mean to be true. To be consistent means to be rigid. I mean, in a certain sense, conclusively established as true or as false. So if something is consistent, means from a epistemological point of view, 
that it has been shown to be the finally true or the finally not true. Something is, from my point of view, something is inconsistent or contradictory if I have good reasons to believe A. I mean, sentence A is taken to be contradictory, not because there is a square and round tower in the middle of the city, but because I have good reasons to take A as true, and I have good reasons to take not A also as true. I have not conclusive evidence, either for A, not for not A. So, to be consistent means to have been conclusively established. So, the idea of uh, uh, unsuspicious means something has been conclusively established and is true. And is true. Now, the idea then is to uh, go from a logic of formal inconsistent towards a logic of formal plenitude, as they call it. So, you, now we drop this A, A implies B, derives B. I mean, I, I, I'll be dropping, I'll be cancel uh, more exponents. While A and A and B and A is uh, unsuspicious, then let me be. So, in other words, in other words, I need A implies B, A consistent, and A to get B. I cannot apply modus ponens if I have not paid the price or proved it or accepted or whatever that A is itself consistent and true. Okay? So, from only from just for this kind of little modification, I can show you how we can build a theory of truth that in principle will solve or avoid the liar and the curious paradox. Uh, I will explain also uh, some, again, philosophical motivations for this kind of thing and to show what we gain by, by inventing, by introducing this logic of formal plenitude. Okay. Now, the idea is the following. Suppose you want to build a theory of truth, I will call it Viron, an abbreviated VR, with the following, the following uh, <coughs> characteristics. So VR is an extension of Piano arithmetic, and I will be adding a truth predicate to the language of PA and adding the T scheme as an action scheme. So without any modification. The full T scheme. So as VR includes piano arithmetic, or dedicated piano arithmetic, if you prefer, by means of the arithmetization of syntax, VR can talk about the very sentence, it's its, it's own sentence. I mean, it, it's semantically, semantically closed language. So at the same time, I'm not avoiding any semantically closed language, and I'm not uh, making any, any, any amending, any, any difference or any restriction to the uh, truth predicate. And the underlying logic of, of VR should be classical, so it, it satisfies the three conditions presented above. Now, let's go back a, a little bit again and see how, is, how, how are the paradoxes and danger. So, as you know, uh, uh, if, if you recall the diagonal lemma, if the AX is a predicate of the language of VR, with just X3, then there is a sentence in D such that D is uh, from, from this uh, theory of truth, because I, I, I'm, I'm assuming PA inside of it, I have D if and only if A holds for the good number of D. Kind of uh, code, or there are many of them as I was saying yesterday. So D is roughly equivalent to a sense that says that D has proper A. Now, if you take this sentence in not, or this formula not, the Tx, the predicate says obviously X is not true, and then it can be proven that there is a sentence in lambda in the language such that VR holds uh, or entails the following, lambda if and only if, not the lambda. Now, by the T scheme, we have that Lambda is the case if and only if TA. Now, of course, as I have here, lambda equivalent to not TA and lambda equivalent to TA, from steps one, two, we get a contradiction of a few steps. So, in classical logic, VR is trivial, of course. Isn't it? So, 
As I said, I can try to solve this problem by using a paraconsistent logic and negation could be seen in a weaker sense as a paraconsistent negation and I would be blocking this step from a contradiction to triviality, I would be blocking by using a weaker negation, but I cannot avoid still uh, Curry's paradox, uh, as you know, there's a very well-known and famous uh, small derivation in five steps, uh, because if I take this predicate t of x implies p, that's a kind of a positive, uh, of course the trick is, this is a kind of a positive negation, in a sense, as you know, but I cannot, I cannot, I cannot avoid it calling it a positive, because there's no negation, so it's a tricky way of introducing negation, uh, where p is any sense one wants, by the diagonal lemma, then I have c for Kirby, if and only if t c implies p, if I plug it here, by the diagonal lemma, by the t schema, then c is if and only if t c again, and then I have something c equivalent to c implies p, this is obviously trivial, trivializes any, any logic, if I have that. So, but the proof is itself a nice evidence that triviality does not coincide with contradiction. There's an important point here. Proof itself shows me that, I mean, a, a, good, a very good point for a consistent logicians, uh, the way I do it, because then I, it's clear here that triviality has in principle no thing to do with contradiction. Even in classical logic. Of course, contradictions entail triviality, but not the only contradiction, right? Okay. So this proof of uh, the triviality by Curry's, uh, the Curry's objection has some, some following points, modus ponens, definition of uh, if and only if, by means of a conjunction and implication, deduction theorem, and the thinning rule, weakening rule, uh, and but the important point is that this proof can be carried out even in positive intuitionistic sentence logic. It's really, really serious proof because you, it's very hard to avoid it. Even if you start from the very minimum concerning positive statement, which is positive intuitionistic logic, you have it. So, uh, if this logic, for instance, is given by this very simple uh, Hilbert system for, for involving implication, uh, conjunction, and, uh, and disjunction, it will be sufficient to generate this uh, Curry's objection. Uh, well, I, I, I could block it by, for instance, if I decide to drop absorption from our logic, or pseudo modus ponens, A and a n, A implies B implies uh, entails B. Uh, I could avoid the triviality by blocking those two principles, but I do not want to reject them because they are, in principle, they are very basic from 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 intuitionistic sentence logic, which is supposed to be very reliable. So what we do is that we take positive intuition logic as a starting point and put an, a new apparatus on, on top of it. Uh, okay, so that's just a motivation, just to finish this motivation, so let's see how we can build a theory. So again, coming back to the idea of paraconsistent without dialectism, uh, so Pfefferman, in, in that paper, he's sort of identifying paraconsistency with system, as he says, in which contradictions can be proved or in which the logic is dialectic, without leading to inconsistent in the sense of his statements following Pfefferman in 2008. So that's a, he's not right in making this identification. So there's a big mistake in it. So paraconsistent logic do not prove any contradictions, at least the way we do it. We are not dialectic, you know, to start with, and we, we are not, this is our way, not proving any contradictions. What we do is that we accept contradictory assumptions. Does not, we do not prove anything that has not been proven in classical logic. 
So, uh, these uh, paraconsistent LFIs or logic of formal inconsistent are subclassical logics. They just prove less than classical logic. No extra, no single extra that classical logic has not itself proven. So he's wrong when he thinks that paraconsistent logic would prove contradictions. Like this is as wrong as saying that intuition is logic is proved the negation of excluded middle. It does not. But there's a sort of a cultural mistake. Okay, I, I can say that publicly because I wrote to Pfefferman saying that. That's why he gave me this challenge. Go and do it. Uh, okay, so um, very clear, I mean, very briefly uh, explaining what this slide says. I always start with Hubert uh, when he said the following I myself have always supposed that only statements and hypotheses, insofar as they lead through deduction of these statements, could contradict you one another. Only statements and hypotheses, right? The view that facts and events could themselves be in contradiction seems to me to be a prime example of careless thinking. So I perfectly agree with him on this point. So only hypotheses, the statements, can be contradictory. I don't need it. So I do not need the idea that anything in the world a fact or an object to worse is it, going to is itself contradictory. So, okay. Uh, so, okay, but if there are no true contradictions, what's the point of our consistent logic? Well, precisely that way, uh, even if there is, well, I do not say that there have any proof that there are no contradictions in the world. I cannot say that. It may be. I always say that I do not need to start from this assumption. There is a very nice phenomenon. So the history of science will be completely different. If I find an asteroid, which is not an asteroid, I don't know. But I don't need that. I don't say it's impossible. Even so, even if there is no example of anything contradicting the world, Paraconsistent logic is interesting by itself because it helps us to reason under contradiction, under the pressure of contradiction. And reasoning is what logic is about. I suppose you are going to agree with me. Right? So, for instance, in a practical matters like a database, database they need it. So they, some system database are using this kind of a tame but a consistent logic in a way, way or another to help make uh, sense of inco incoherent databases or programming language prolog for instance can be artificial intelligence and, and I mean, artificial artificial uh, ways of reasoning are in kind of need of this kind of a, of a, a mechanism a classical logic is to is too brute for them. Okay. So contradictions then may be taken as a provisional state, a kind of excessive or defective information that should, at least in principle, be eliminated by means of further investigation. It's a provisional state, like it happens all the time in, in the history of science. So it's, I cannot, I don't need to give you examples of that kind of a contradiction in the history of science and in scientific investigation. Or, or even in a, in a trial, in a justice investigation, or in a police investigation. For instance, policemen are very happy when they catch two guys and they interview them, as you know, separately. Why? Because they want to take them in contradiction. If they, those guys are excellent liars and they lie perfectly well, nobody's going to catch them. The only question is if one of them does not lie so good, right? So contradictions are, are very, uh, contradictions are gold in, 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 in many any kinds of investigation, in political investigations, as you know, any kinds of, so 
When you find a contradiction, then you know that something is wrong there. So they are very good rational sign. And not anything to be eliminated. That's the way we, we, we see them here. Okay? Uh, so, contradictions may be seen from a purely epistemological viewpoint. So, due to possible limitations of our cognitive apparatus, our failure of, oh, not, not our, but the failing of measuring instruments and interactions of these instruments with phenomena, with people, stages in the development of theories, simple mistakes that in principle could be corrected later on, in all these cases, contradictions are related primarily to knowledge and thought. That's what we call epistemic contradictions. Okay? Not to facts, in principle. So, okay, so going back to this logical or formal inconsistency, uh, our logic then, that, uh, they have resources for formally representing these views. Which kind of views? Uh, Contradiction information is found in, number, in a number of contexts of reasoning. Uh, logic does not change much. I mean, what do I mean by that? We do not to change drastically logic in order to have a nice logic to be able to reason on a contradiction. The basic change is the one I, I showed you. You sort of eliminate the law of explosion and put a... a um, a uh, caveat to it. And A and not A only entails B if A is fragile, if A is rigid, if A is not flexible, is not malleable. Okay. Uh, so, in a sense, the contradiction, if I find it, just put aside, waiting a later decision. And the principle of explosion is then not applied. Uh, because why is that so? Because exactly I mean, classical logic forces us to draw foolish conclusions for any contradiction, but we do not do it as human thinkers. Never do it. So we really, as human thinkers, we do not apply classical logic. I mean, in, in the sense of um, we apply many principles, but not that one. Uh, so the Alephites internalize the logical formal inconsistency, internalize the meta theoretical notion of consistency, expressing it in the objective language by the little ball A, means that A is, is consistent, and then the application of principle explosion as restricted to consistent sentences. Okay. Uh, so it can be done in a way that I really recover classical logic if I need it. So I'm not rejecting. Just putting a, some restrictions in order to apply classical logic. So I can prove the following derivability adjustment theorem, for instance, <laughs> which says the following. For any set gamma B, there is A such that gamma classically entails B, so any classical reasoning like gamma entails classically B, holds if and only if gamma plus a certain set of uh, assumptions concerning consistent in my LFI, we will uh, entail B again. So, what does it mean? I do not lose any classical theorem. I only require that if I want to recover that classical theorem or the classical derivation, I need to consider some points as coherent, as consistent, or as rigid. And I, if I want to recover all classical logic, full classical logic, I just take this set of a uh, little ball gamma uh, delta here. I mean, uh, uh, the sentence will I'm taking uh, by principle to take as consistent, and the whole set of sentences. Then I recover classical logic again. Okay, now. Let's go, let's go to this basic logic of consistency. Uh, we add to a natural deduction system. So suppose I have a natural deduction system for implication, conjunction, and, dedu uh, and disjunction, minus modus ponens, uh, modus ponens, the following inference rule. So uh, A is consistent. A and not A entails B, and then exclude the middle as an axiom again. So this is my basic logic of consistency. Why? 
because this logic entails me, or, or yeah, entails me to talk about the consistent in a sort of a rational way. So why not write the deductions instead of the Hilbert axioms? Well, that's because uh, they are better suited for this purpose, so they have rules, and you could, even if you if you like, you could take uh, some Hilbert axioms for for axiomatizing uh, the whole power of implication, conjunction, and disjunction. But that's a, that's a technical problem. Some people like it. Some people don't. I'm starting to like more and more. Uh, so, restricting explosion. The bi basic idea behind this principle, BC1, what is BC1? Is here, BC1 prime, because I, I, I'm calling it prime because I, uh, I'm copying it to another, another system. So, the basic idea behind this principle is that there cannot be a formula A such that A is consistent and we also have A and not A. Otherwise, you get to God. So, Classical logic, A and not A is, is not possible. It's impossible to have conjointly A and not A. In LFIs, what's impossible is to have A and not A and A consistent. That's all. That, that's the only, the, the, the only idea that I have to logic. Okay? Uh, well, there are semantical clauses. I can, I, I can find a... a, a a very easy semantics for this logic by taking a binary zero one semantics uh, just by, by modifying slightly the classical conditions. So V of not A is zero, then V of A is one, but I do not have if and only if here. Just drop the if and only if. And I have the following rule, the following clause. If uh, V of consistence A is one, then either a is zero or not A is zero. I mean, for a consistent sentence, one of them must be false. A and not A. You cannot have, at the same time, something rigid, consistent, true, and consistent. Remember that consistent means to have been conclusively established. I cannot have something conclusively established, okay, absolutely conclusively established, and have at the same time a is true and no, not A is true. One of them must be false. I have decided it. So only by modifying the semantics in this way, just with this little two modification here, I can give a proof of completeness for this logic. Right? And there's another, other kinds of semantics as well. So what's the intended meaning of negation and uh, consistent according to the above clause, semantic clause. So, the values 1 and 0 attributed to the formula being interpreted respectively as there is some evidence that is the case and there is some evidence that A is not the case. So, A and, only in, a, a and not A means only that there is evidence that A is and is not the case. A situation very common in the empirical world. So, uh, so uh, consistent may be, be, be interpreted as the truth value of A has been conclusively established by means of an investigation or a process or a procedure or whatever. So we may have A and not A as true without uh, consistent A. For instance, a circumstance such that evidence only for A or for not A, but the truth value of A or not A has not been decided yet. So, okay. So this is the logic of um, talking about, to sum up, logic that talks about consistency and negation in a very epistemological way, without needing any need for extra metaphysical assumptions. Uh, so although BLC restricts its classical inference, it actually extend this conventional reason, making it able to deal with situations where it would otherwise stop, like it, the police investigation, for instance, and recovering classical logic when it's appropriate. Okay. Now, ten more minutes. Oh my goodness! I have um, twenty slides. Let me go quickly. <laughs> uh, okay. Let me jump to the the idea of um, formal plenitude. Uh,
I go very quickly to this slide here. Then I have this following definition. Uh, we're defining uh, the star A as ball A and A mean that logic, that we mean that's, uh, A has been concluded, established as a true proposition. So I have now two steps at the same time. So A has been concluded, established, and is true. I've been uh, unsuspicious. Okay. And now I change in my, my logic, BCL, the previous rule. Now I have a first order version of it. So I add first order machinery to it very quickly. I don't have time to explain. And I add the following rule. A is star, and A implies B entails B, which actually means A a consistence and A implies B, then I am entitled to derive B. So the system is solved the time is B O L C star, a first order logic of formal plenitude. So, uh, so the difference between ball and star is the following. As I said, ball A means that truth value has been well established or completely established, either as true or false, while star A means that truth value has been established as true, that means as unsuspicious. Okay. So, again, I can recover classical reasoning in, inside of this logic of BLC, which I, I recall it's a first order logic of infinitude. And in order to now to go to the theory of truth, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to add this uh, some, something called fullness schema. So, if P, piano arithmetic proves A, then in my theory of truth, Star A is taken as a theorem. Okay, so anything that comes in for arithmetic is assumed, is supposed to be trustful, is supposed to be unsuspicious. Everything coming from arithmetic, is in, and only things coming from arithmetic are, are, are thought to be unsuspicious. In a certain sense, only numbers are taken to be fragile or not malleable. All other concepts in principle can be. So everything PA proves is full with respect to implication. Uh, so the theorems of PA are supposed to be trustful, conclusively established, and taken as true ab ovo from the beginning. Now other consequences for my theory of truth. Uh, for any theorems of PA, VR proves TA, because PA entails A by hypothesis. VR proves star of A by my fullness schema. A implies TA, part of the T schema, and then VR entails TA. So what I have here is that if PA proves anything, my theory of truth accepts TA in my formal predicate. Uh, so VR is materially adequate, you can, it's easy to see, and all instances of diagonal lemma for formal of PA, with one free variable, we hold, since these results are inherited, from PA through my, uh, my fullness schema. Now, uh, let me just see how many slides I have to, okay, I have a few slides just to. May I ask a clarification? Yes, yes, sure. So you say uh, the fullness schema, if something is equivalent to PA, then um, and your logic is also um, trustworthy, uh, it's star A, but PA, do you mean PA in the extended language where you have the truth predicate? In it, or no, the proof predicate is in VR. Yeah. So, so it's outside. Active with a, not in the language. Of yeah, the, yeah. So VR is extending PA plus this predicate. That's all. With this restriction to logic. Okay. Now, uh, now what happens here is that the user derivation of the diagonal limit is respected to lambda and C. Even, I don't know if they hold or not in my logic, in my, my, lo, in my schema of VR, but if they hold, they are blocking. So I will be very easily avoiding Curry paradox. Why? Because all my, 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 my Curry paradox that I have seen involves using of uh, modus ponens in many places. I only will be using many pla uh, modus ponens here if I suppose that the points that I'm using outside arithmetic are uh, uh, trustful or are unsuspicious. Okay? So now the paradox is blocked because it's your job to prove that the steps you are doing are unsuspicious. Well, of course, 
Any statement concerning truth is by principle suspicion. <laughs> we have to give me an, uh, an argument showing that it's not suspicious in order to, if you do it, if you, so in a certain sense you cannot do it because you cannot at the same time swear or argue that everything concerning truth is consistent. And then you're going to have the current paradox again. But the price is you gave the argument that they are unsuspicious. So you have to prove it before. So I very easily, in a sense, avoid the courage paradox here because of blocking most ponens applications where I'm not sure if the steps are being uh, 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 what I'm doing. So I'm only sure about arithmetic itself, not about true statements about arithmetic. Uh, now, what happens, you know, of, of course, I, I had already blocked it before the liar paradox because of using of a weak negation. So at this point, I have blocked the two paradoxes, liar and carry. Now, if you take truth predicate in a transcendental sense as something that refers to the notion of truth outside PA, for instance, in the case of a ghetto sentence, uh, true in a standard model or true in set theory outside PA, <clears throat> we still uh, ha only have the corresponding instance of the T schema. So VR, I, I have in my, my, my uh, theory of truth VR, G for ghetto sentence, if and only if uh, TG holds. But what I have is PR does not itself, it does not prove a ghetto sentence. So VR, in principle, does not prove TG. I only have the equivalence, but not TG itself. VR only proves TA for senses that belong to the language of the PA and arithmetic. So this is very reasonable, and in, I mean, in agreement to any nice theory of truth, <clears throat> because also PA does not prove not G. This, although G is, is, is true outside VR, I do not have VR proving G, and I do not here proving uh, the true of not G. So, v, VR is in complete agreement with Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. I'm not violating Gödel's theorem here. So, my, my, that's what a good test for a theory of truth, I believe. <clears throat> so, uh, what do we have here? Very, uh, I don't know how much time I have. Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> He's asked the issues. <laughs> I'm starting to discuss it. <clears throat> Let me see what I have to say about this slide here. So this VR, then, what it does is that it relates two notions, true and conclusively established as true, respectively represented by the truth predicate and by my star connected. <clears throat> so this theory of truth naturally distinguishes between two things here. What's to be true? by means of applying this, this, this rigid predicate here and to be conclusively established as true is another thing. It contrasts those kind, this kind of, uh, those kind of views. <clears throat> so the first one is ontological in character, while the, the second one, the star one, is epistemological. So <clears throat> in this VR, goes, as I say, from the epistemological to the ontological. I mean, uh, <clears throat> if I have proven it, it is the case, but not, not, not the country, right? So what we have here, to sum up, is a kind of a expected asymmetry between probability and truth inside my theory of truth. This asymmetry, of course, is what lays behind Gill's theorem, right? And I may have here it inside my, 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 my way of, um, okay, after Gill, you can say it's easy to suspect that about Gero, but it's not so easy to put this in a formal system to start with. <clears throat> so what we have got here, we have now a new, simple, very simple theory of truth, Viru, which avoids the liar and the curry at one stroke. So it's mathematically quite simple. It corresponds to an idea of informal reasoning of not to perform inferences if my assumptions are suspicious. This seems to be very natural. I block reasoning if I suspect, I mean, that's in the principle of a, of a rational argumentation, I mean, if you suspect that my opponent is lying to me, 
or anything like that, or it's cheating me, I stop reasoning, sir. It's not suspicious reasoning, it's not good reasoning. And the video deals with two notions, epistemological notion, fullness, or unsuspiciousness, with an epistemological character, and truth with an ontological ingredient. <clears throat> now, it's for you to judge, and I'd like to very much to have your opinion here. Thank you very much. Finally, your star operator is something like a kind of way of internalizing in the language or using a kind of modality for saying that what you want is in fact a, a proposition plus his, its proof object. Yeah. I mean, so, okay, so, so you. It's I mean, a, modality in this No, not modality. In not, yeah, in a in very principle, you could do also but, with the squares and. But, but, but the idea, more or less, is that you, you don't do, want just a proposition, but you want a proposition with its proof object. Yes. Okay, I see. Yeah. So it's very Martin Lovian in a certain sense. Well, <laughs> you know, what? what? Martin Lovian. Oh, Martin Lovian. Martin Lovian. Yeah. 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 But, uh, no. uh, sorry, one other thing is that uh, do you have a, a, a deduction theorem for your. Um, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Deduction theorem holds you up. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's okay. Um, most of the I mean, basic brief of laws we hold So that's the, the, I think the artistic part of it. Is to, as I say, to tame logic, but not too much. Mm. You still have a logic. Mm. If you tame it too much, like a horse, tame it too much, not a horse anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have Marco, then Leon, Wagner, uh, Mattia, Volker, and. <laughs> 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 My goodness, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> Marco, 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 Marco. <coughs> so, Fatia, three very, very, very simple questions. First, you use a, you define a star in terms of uh, consistency, or consistent. But you need that. You can you use a primitive uh, uh, operator. Why you need uh, to define? Because I have operator. already, I have already yeah, uh, in my logic, it's consistent. Do, so I would not to to, to, to to need it more. One new thing if I don't need it. So I, I I'm taking profit of the work already done. In terms of understanding what consistency but, is. Yes, but it, it seems to me that. Uh, whether your definition of unsuspicious is quite uh, clear, the other of consistence could be more doubtful. So it seems to me that you could uh, uh, avoid the problems if you define, you avoid the other. Maybe. So, maybe. I, 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 the, sec I don't the, the second question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. I mean, I, I don't see why unsuspiciousness would be more accepted than consistency. Because one of them may refer, but I don't know. Anyway, it's a, a uh, uh, Second. Do you think that you cannot uh, uh, add something similar by using non-monotonic logic instead of... Uh, if I use non-monotonic logic, then I will be taming logic too much. Of course, I, 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 I lose completeness, I lose okay. model theory, I lose everything. Okay. Okay. You know, that's to be cutting the, the leg of a horse. Okay. I want the first one. I don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have a question. You said uh, even if... So, or even if I can prove um, the, that um, the curry sentence has a diagonal property, if I if I yeah. might might be able to prove, but but I I would think you can't because okay, if I can, to, better. I, I don't have any argument why I cannot. But that's why that you don't have a curry sentence anymore. I mean, you have the sentence, but you don't. But but according to your logic, it doesn't say of itself that um, if it's true, then B holds or whatever. You're so that means, yeah. Yeah, so in some sense, you can say um, the curry sentence doesn't exist, in, or according to my theory, I think. Yeah, that's, okay. not, that's not really solving it. I yeah, that disappears with it. Yes, and then that's killing it. Well, I see. I see. But uh, the problem is, what? what yeah, I, I understand your point. So it, it's the same for the liar sentence. If you'd say, okay, I weaken my logic in such a sense that I cannot prove of the liar sentence that L, if and only if not true of L, that it, has, that it says of itself that it's not true. I've solved the liar sentence. I would say there's no soul liar, where if you just say there's no liar sentence, uh, okay. as far as my theory is concerned. I understand that point. Well, of course, I can say, uh, if I start from the following uh, understanding, the liar is an argument that he holds in classical logic, this and this and that. <coughs> but then I, I, I'm a begging the question somehow. 
If the liar is something that it happens in classical logic, I'm fortunate not to change the logic. You know? So the question is, what is the liar and what is Curry? Is this the reasoning? Is this Curry objection and reasoning? Or is it a sentence? I, I see it as a reasoning, not as a sentence. You know? I think that, that would, would make us in different fields. So if you see it as a sentence, and a sentence in classical logic, of course, I had just, I mean, I, I, I mean, I would change the world. I don't know the world. So this is debatable. Yeah, but, but a small question is yeah. your logic or framework in general, it looks to me a bit like what these people in Belgium and Ghent have been doing when they talk about adaptive logic. They say in consistent Precisely. Like, Good point. Is this exactly the same thing? No, no, it's not exactly the same. Actually, uh, oh, well, I have a contact with Bartens and with Peter Verde, with those people since a long time, and Peter was in Campinas for a couple of years. Um, what, well, they have a different beginning of the story. They also control the inconsistency or the contradictions by using this uh, upper limit logic, lower limit logic, this adaptive logic. It's completely different. Completely different. They have this comp but, but, Bartens has just proved uh, there's just wrote a paper showing that our way of looking into this logic, and especially one logic named CI, or the logical form inconsistent, coincides with this. So it's the same theory? No, I mean, one of our logic coincides with his way of, uh, I mean, in our, our way of doing it is more general in a sense. That's it. It does not coincide with science. Okay, we have eight more minutes and. Four more questions. So, <laughs> I would like my question was really short, and uh, it's in the philosophical side. Um, I have stressed to you and Marcel many times that I thought uh, the philosophy of paraconsistent to be somehow in fault. You pointed that you disagree with the dialectism. I, I believe that many people here don't agree with the dialectism, and then you pointed. Uh, that uh, there are extensive reasons for considering a paraconsistent logic. But then, if you use the justification, uh, epistemological uh, justification, mm. then I think you should drop out of your logic the third uh, exclusion. It should not be in your logic, because this is what is about intuitionistic logic. I don't see why, because you know I, I, I'm not making an intuition. It's just criticizing the classical logic. I mean, yeah, they I drop know. part of it. They cancel part. I'm not canceling the same. So I'm not. I'm not making the same criticism as the intuitionists do. Yeah, but the, your point is that you are from the philosophical side defending your logic by appealing, let's say, to epistemological considerations, mm -hmm. and this is how intuitionistic logic starts well, by it, it is no well, different epistemological considerations I mean they are, they are, we are using epistemology is why to, I mean they con it's not the same that they are doing they, they have a different way of, of epistemic reasoning or epistemic argumentation I don't follow them from this point of view so I'm not constructing proofs I don't know, I'm not doing not going in this direction I'm not suspecting of a, a non-constructive proofs or anything I could do but I here I'm not. <clears throat> By the way, let me just mention one thing. This, this work has been done in collaboration with Abilio Rodriguez, but my partner uh, in this uh, story has been me, Marcelo Codillo, and we, are, we have a new book that's going to appear by spring, you are going to see it I mean, very soon, namely Consistent Contradiction and Negation, where we are going to present several issues on this, uh, this kind of uh, family of logics, and we hope some philosophical clarifications in the sense that you, you are, you are, you are criticizing. Okay. Not here. Um, yes. Yeah. So thank you very much for the talk. Um, so my, uh, I have a couple of questions. They are, they are quite short, so I mm. hope uh, the answer will be shorter too. Um, so the first one is a quite, uh, it's a, a it's, can be seen as a follow up of uh, what Alberto was trying to, to say at the beginning of the first question. So, um, if we look at your definition, uh, so I, I just the want star. To, yes, the, the, the star operator. So, yeah. I just want 
to understand a little bit, it's, it's a clarification question. I just want to understand a little bit better what you mean when you are saying we are, we are attaining in a certain sense our logic, but in a certain sense we, what we get is still logic. Okay, so it presupposes, of course, some criteria of what lo logic is. Of yes. Course. So, yes. so it's, it's basically um, a, a clarification question. Because, for example, if we consider it, okay, the, the star operator uh, includes in its definition this ball uh, operator, and uh, we can see it as a kind of modality, and uh, some, we, as we know, some criteria of uh, what a logical constant is exclude the, the, the possibility to have uh, modalities as a logical operator. So I'm just trying to understand better in which sense because you don't have what is phonance, for example, in its full form when you when you <coughs> so in which sense you can consider it still Okay. Uh, in which sense it's still logic. logic okay. Yeah. And then there's a, a second remark, but maybe uh, just if you want to answer to this first and well, we can you make it maybe second, maybe, maybe. Okay, and the second is just a, a short remark, maybe a very trivial one. Um, could you please go back to the definition of when you uh, this slide where you were talking about the Carus paradox? Um, Main so, proof of Carus. Uh, yes, at the, almost the beginning of the of the talk, where you claim that uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the problem, yes, this mm. one. So when you consider the the truth framing as defined in this way, uh, does is it possible? I mean, it it. Re in a certain sense, it reminds me of um, something really similar to um, minimal negation. Mm. Uh, that is to say, um, okay, you, 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 you have a parametric form of negation. Okay? So, is it possible to, to make uh, some kind of parallel between uh, these, these two, uh, the definition of two predicate in this uh, formal context and uh, the minimal negation, uh, so to um, challenge the idea that uh, you, you, you you, you don't use negation in the... the, the well, I don't know. Well, uh, did this, let me start for a second from the second question. I don't know. I don't know if I can compare this with uh, this parametric negation. Well, in a certain sense, yes, but I, I have not thought about that. You know, this is, this is a way why, um, how this, this thing can be seen as a negation. Mm -hmm. It's a negation in disguise. Mm -hmm. right? In a certain sense. A negation in disguise. <coughs> But I, I don't know how to compare it to, to, to minimal yeah. logic. I, I have no thought about it. Okay. Right. Because no. I really feel that, I mean, uh, the, the, this, mm. this guy's rent, I don't know how to say, can be, sorry. You mean by Costa Doshen? Costa Doshen? Precise, yeah. Costa Doshen, for instance, yes, work, yeah. Example, yes. yeah. Yeah, well, I know. I have not thought about that. But uh, back to your first question. Why, in which sense is this still logic? <laughs> well, most partners is not full. But you can make it full by, by, by this derivability adjustment theorem. Just by adding premises, you get more spawns again. So you need the premises, you, you add the premises you need. In this way, you, you do not, so it's a logic because you do not reject any classical theory. And the second, because you still have here uh, com uh, completeness, decidability, or not mm -hmm. decidability and model theory. I mean, you can, you sort of can remake what you had in modern theory of logic completely here. In the sense of geologic. Mm -hmm. Very close to class. So, so, so my suspicion is what the price you have to pay for this is really to give up conditional proof. So what happens all the time in mathematics, you assume something, apply all exponents, get somewhere, and then conditionalize it. Arrow introduction. Here you block it. You have to say, no, you can't just assume anything. First you have to show it's provable in PR arithmetic. So the price you will have to pay is basically mathematics. They so get something <laughs> in arithmetic, and then you can't, I mean, give a conditional proof. Because first you have to show it, and then you can start doing something. What we do in mathematics all the time is we assume something, we don't know whether it's provable or not, and we get somewhere. Right. Here you can't do it. No. If, if I tell my number to his colleagues, I mean, before applying modus ponens, you first have to show A in piano arithmetic. <coughs> now, look, uh, well, first of all, I, uh, piano arithmetic is supposed to be uh, reliable, unsuspicious, but not only piano arithmetic. Piano arithmetic to start with, but anything that you can, you, that you 
argue to me and show me that coherent or truthful or other species, you can do the logic. Not the only. I mean, I, I, I'm restricted here with my theory of truth about piano arithmetic. My VR, my theory of Verum, is about the truth of piano arithmetic. That's why I'm restricting only talking about piano arithmetic. But this is, of course, a theory of, about piano arithmetic. But for in, 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 in other contexts, I not, it's not that only piano arithmetic is supposed to be. No, 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 that's, that's, that's not what I mean. For instance, I mean, we want to give a conditional proof on Goldbach's conjecture. You can't do that. You can assume it, see what happens. You have to say, no, no, you first have to prove Goldbach's conjecture, and then you can give a conditional proof that relies on that. Only when you're applying monosponics. Yeah. Okay. For instance, we are doing doing doing. We do that quite a lot in math. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but what I wanted to do. For instance, <laughs> we have a very last question, Mohammed. Uh, I had a same question for empirical facts. If I, then you say you, you say that uh, it's unjustified to use modus ponens in empirical facts because empirical. Uh, uh, are there thirty second answers? <laughs> <laughs> no. You have to, talk, to tell me which empirical factors you accept as truthful, you answer not. I, I you have to tell me. Yeah, because you introduced an introduction rule for your star. Uh, but but this kind of... Uh, uh, do, do we have an inferentialist form for introducing a star for empirical facts? Uh, but in, or empirical facts is uh, are something outside logic. You, 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 it's no. your, you, you pay the price and use it. And you pay the consequences. <laughs> That's my question. And my third second. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh,